Well, come on, church. Who's glad to be in church today? Come on, yeah. It's so good. I want to take a moment. I want to welcome all of our locations in Cortland, Corning, Ithaca, and Binghamton. And I'm going to get lost track of all the locations as we add them along. But can we take a second and just welcome everybody joining us online and at all of our locations. We love you guys. I want you to know that I pray for you. I care about you. I love you. And I'm so glad to be able to be with you right now. We are in week number two of a four-part series entitled The Daniel Dilemma. And this series is all about how to live our lives in a pagan or a secular culture, an ungodly culture. So Daniel, uh, if you go in your Bibles, you'll find the book of Daniel. It's a prophetic book and a book of history, but I think it speaks to this moment right now because Daniel was, had this unbelievable ability to stay firm in his faith and influence an ungodly culture. And the question that I have, and I think everybody is grappling with, how do we do what Daniel did? How do you stand firm in your faith while living in an ungodly culture at the same time? And I really believe we're in this dilemma as Christians that we're facing the tension of living a godly life in the ungodly culture. And and so we have to discern how do we navigate through all of that. To stand firm and to love well. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about a message entitled Grace and Truth. And we learned without truth, we're corrupt. But without grace, we're condemned. Truth without grace is just plain old mean. Right? We all know who that person is. The truth. They love to tell you the truth. And they just like to be a little mean while they do it. But grace without truth is meaningless. And so our goal is to be like Jesus or like Daniel. Jesus was full of grace and truth. I want you to get your notes out at every single one of our locations. And you're going to write it down on the back of the worship guide that's there. There's not going to be handouts during this series. There's just way too much content to cover I probably had to use two or three of the series guides last week. So uh, just kind of as you're there, go ahead and write down today's message is entitled The Babylon Mentality. The Babylon Mentality. And writing that down, you can turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. And so just for a few minutes, I want to teach a few ideas that I think we're going to need in order to be able to stand firm and love well. And so you can't stand firm and love well in an ungodly culture if you don't know the difference between a godly culture and an ungodly culture. Some of us, we've been in this culture so long and we haven't been in the word enough to understand the difference between what is godly culture and what isn't a godly culture. And so what I want us to do is I want us to turn to the Word of God, and I want us to begin to inform our lives about the challenge that this is. Because some of us, you may not have ever had to distinguish the difference between what's happening at your school, what your teachers might be saying, or what the other students around you might be saying, and what the Word of God is saying. Or at your office, Everybody may be going out and doing the things that they're doing or talking at the water cooler about what they're experiencing, and there may be no perception of what God is saying about those things. And so this is what Jesus' prayer was in John chapter 17. He said in verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Jesus is saying, and he's praying, God, don't take them out of the world. And that, isn't that so oftentimes the prayer, God, would you just take me out of here? This place is all messed up. This place is jacked up. These people are messed up. I need, I, get me out of here. Anytime you have a little opposition in your life, or anytime things are messed up, get me out of here. And God's saying, I don't want to take them out of the world. But I do want to protect them, not from adversity, not from difficulty, but I want to protect them from, everybody together, from the evil one. 
And so here's, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying we can be in the world, but not be worldly. And I want to I wanna describe what that is, because when I, when I see people, they'll read in the Bible, it says, don't love the world or anything in the world. What they think is that I can't enjoy clothing, I can't love television, I can't love the car that I have out in my driveway. And what God is saying is, if you put that above him, if you love, in fact, you love your family member above him, then it becomes worldly. And we're gonna explain what that is, what it is to be worldly in the world. And this is where I'm gonna lose about half of us. This is, I need you to pay attention now. Because explaining this is where half the world gets off the bus, worldly and world, and I don't know, I'm on tune, I better get on Facebook, and, or whatever the thing is. And, and so listen to me now. Culture in and of itself is not evil. It is influenced by the evil one. There's a difference between the world and the supernatural entities that are in the world. There is an antichrist spirit, and I'm going to call that today the Babylon mentality. I'm going to show you how the antichrist spirit and the Babylon mentality are the same thing. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13, also that everyone should eat and drink, and look at this, and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in the earth God created for our pleasure. This is probably not something you'll hear very often. That God, when he created the earth, he said it was good. You read the very first chapters of the Bible. It was good, it is good, it is good, it is good. Then in all of God's good creation, he said to mankind, Fill the earth, take dominion over it, enjoy it. And then we find in the garden, the snake. And so what you discover is that Satan in that moment enticed man into sin and brought the beginnings of the Babylon mentality into the world. And so here's what worldliness is. The Acts in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 21, they're spelled out. The acts of the flesh are obvious. This is what sin is in a nice list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord. Uh-oh. Everybody was up and, get him, pastor. He's talking about sexual immorality. He's preaching the truth in here. And then all of a sudden we start talking about hatred and discord and jealousy so now this pastor has lost his way. How dare he talk about fits of rage and selfish ambition, dissensions. I have to be friendly to people, factions, and envy. See, we got a, when I grew up in the church, the list of sins was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You couldn't do none of that. But you better never talk about covetousness. You better never talk about envy or greed, right? So envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Oh, we're back into the safe territory again. All right. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? So this is what worldliness is, well-defined. Not one of those things was a physical attribute in the world. But let me be clear, there are physical attributes in the world that can be transmitters of these things. Okay? So there are things in the world that can transmit worldly things. So stay with me now. Everything in the world is for our enjoyment. Everything. God created all the world is for us. But everything that is worldly is off limits. Everything that's worldly is off limits. You, you're not in a battle with Jennifer Lopez in the Super Bowl halftime show. All right? Now, 
I know if you're on Facebook or some social media thing, by golly, Jennifer Lopez might as well be the devil. But I'll tell you what you're in a battle with. You're in a battle with the thoughts that flowed through that show. See, the worldliness wasn't in the halftime show. It was what came through it. What, what was discovered in your heart, what it revealed in you. See, the Bible says, Jesus says, there's nothing that you can consume that will contaminate you. But what defiles a man is what is in his heart and flows up out of it. See, worldliness isn't out here somewhere that I have to be like, oh, no, I went into the wrong room and now I got worldly. It's not the room you went into, it was, it was what went into your heart. And, and so you're in a battle with the thoughts. See, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, I want you to write this down. I want you to write these verses down. You're going to go back and study it. You've got to go back and, and study yourself to show yourself approved. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. And I think that's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. That's the wrong reference. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities. You're saying it's not against people. It's not the physical world. It's the spiritual world. And so, so there's spiritual forces of evil in heaven and realms. And then now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary. See, it's not the world. We're not in a battle with the world. We're in a battle with worldliness. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And I want everybody to pay attention now. Verse 5, we demolish arguments. These are thoughts. Arguments are what happened in marriage. <laughs> See, your battle's not against your wife. The battle is against a difference in agreement. There's a thought that exists and now there's going to be a conflict. And that leads its way into the world. And every pretension, that's a thought, that sets itself up against the what? Against the, everybody together, against the knowledge of God. See, there's godly knowledge, and then there's worldly knowledge. And we take captive every, every what? Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Your thoughts have power that is connected to them in a supernatural realm. That if you want to stand firm in a culture that is ungodly, you had better begin to distinguish that not every thought that comes to me is a godly thought. Not everything that happens around me is a godly thing. And if I'm going to stand firm and love well, I better discover where the battle actually is. Because it's not people. In fact, the Bible says that we are called to be salt and light. The very people that many Christians are running from, they have been called by God to influence. You see what salt and light does is salt is going to preserve it's going to make it better. And light is going to make it brighter. The church of God is not called to come out of the world. The church of God is called to influence the world. And so, so we're called to be salt and light. In fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says, For the secret power of lawlessness, this is another word, you won't connect antichrist and lawlessness in the Babylon mentality, all that together. We're going to jump right into that here. But the one who now holds it back, right now there is a restraining influence in the world that is keeping this supernatural force, this cultural influence at bay. And you know how that's happening? 
is happening through you and me as we partner together with the Holy Spirit. We release the Holy Spirit's restraining, anointing on the man of lawlessness in the spirit of lawlessness that is in this world. Everywhere I go, I bring preservation. Everywhere you go, you bring light. Everywhere you go, the spirit of the living God begins to make the forces of darkness flee before you. And what they are trying to assault you with, they can't cannot win because you are designed to be salt and light. You're designed to be, you see, you're, you're either going to set the culture or you're going to reflect the culture. You're either going to be the thermostat or the thermometer. And God didn't call you to be the thermometer. God didn't call you to test the wind. God didn't call you to see how cool it is outside or how warm it is outside. God said, I want you to turn that thermometer all the way up to 95. And I want it to sweat. I want it to, I want to get the heat turned up in there. And you're going to set it. You're not going to be the one moved by it. And so we're going to learn to stand firm and we're going to learn to love well. And so, so what as a Christian we're called to do, we're not called to reflect culture. But you can be in culture influencing it. And so some people get upset. Oh my goodness, you're, you're not wearing a bonnet and a long dress. And you know that Jesus, when he was alive, he wore a tie in yellow khakis and he had loafers and he showed up at church at 7.30 a.m. with his hair cut short because that's how a real Jesus follower lives. And they have no clue about what worldliness is and what the world is. See, they thought because somebody on TV had long hair, by goodness gracious, that's worldly. And what they forgot was our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against that. It's, it's what comes through. You can have long hair or you can have short hair. It don't matter. You can be just as evil down in your heart. And so this is what the Babylon mentality is. The Bible refers to Babylon in two ways. There's the city of Babylon. It's a location. It's physical. And we can go to it today. The other is a mentality. And all through Scripture, there's prophetically condemnation in prophetic judgment that comes on the Babylon mentality. In, in fact, it says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, the name written on her forehead was a mystery. You need to read Revelation 17 and 18 and 19, the whole, all of that is about Babylon. And it says, Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth, everything evil in the earth, all the abominations of the earth, Babylon the great is the mother of. And it says in, in Revelation 18, 7, this is what Babylon boasts. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. It's really interesting because if you back up into Isaiah chapter 47, verse 8, it talks about Babylon again. It's prophesying judgment on Babylon. It says, now then, listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am and there is none beside me. I'll never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Did we hear what? Babylon is going to say in Revelation chapter 19, I'm never going to suffer the loss of children. I'm never going to be a widow. That's not going to touch me. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm the queen of the world. I, I am. Here's what Isaiah says in 47 verse 9. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day. Loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. You've trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am and there is none besides me. Here's Babylon's motto. I am and there is none besides me. See, the spirit of the Antichrist, the Babylon mentality, this force that is in the world that is setting up a conflict between believers 
in the spiritual forces in heavenly places is leading people into the temptation to say, I am and there is none beside me. In fact, the root of the sin in the Garden of Eden comes from that spirit, the Antichrist. You don't need God. You don't need to listen to God. You don't need to uh, obey God. You're going to do everything out of your mind and out of your functioning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3 says it this way, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus See, the spirit of Babylon mentality says, I am, and there is none beside me. John says, every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard coming, and even now is already in the world. You and I are in this conflict, and the heart or the root of that conflict is either I'm on the throne or God's on the throne. It's the selfie culture. I am. And there's no one else like me. Look at, look at, I'm on the throne. And and the Babylon mentality is a war to win our hearts. See, the Babylon mentality says to elevate self. It's self-adoring. Man, I'm so good looking. Praise myself for how I have created myself. Self-building, self-indulging, never restrain anything from my life, anything I want, I should have at any time. And then as we're elevating ourselves, we're lowering God. God doesn't love me. God doesn't love you. God isn't for you. He wants to. How could he ever ask you to do that? If God was a loving God, he would let you have that. He would let you be in that relationship. He would allow, he understands how difficult your past has been. And therefore, because you had a bad past, he gonna grant you some extra things, some a little extra permissions on the front end, on the back end of your life. And, And what it is, is this temptation to believe, yeah, God isn't for me. And his ways and his decrees are actually keeping me from all the good things. And, and God doesn't want to keep you from anything that's going to bless you. That's his blessing on your life. The guide rails and the rules are designed to bring us to the most joy, to the most peace, to the most fulfillment. And, and so if he can get us to elevate ourselves and lower God, then we've opted in to the Babylon mentality. This is now where we have to begin to discern. How much of this ungodly culture is in me? How much worldliness is in me? How much have I bought into self-adoration and self-building and self-indulging? How much have I bought into this idea that God doesn't love me, that God isn't for me, that God wants too much from me? Because the spirit of the Antichrist, the Babylon mentality, is at work among us today. It says in Revelation that even right now in the church, the spirit of the Antichrist is at work influencing us. So any thoughts that, re- reinf- that reflect or reinforce this mentality need to be opposed. So turn now to Daniel chapter 4. This word Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, He's at home in his palace, and and the Bible says he was, in verse 4, contented and prosperous. And and he begins to have a dream, and in his dream, he sees this great tree that's out in the field, and and what comes is there's a, the tree is cut down, and only the stump remains. He calls together all of his wise men and astrologers to tell me the meaning of this dream. None of them can do it. So they say, hey, there is one man. There's this man, Daniel. He serves and honors the Lord. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel and he explains the dream and says, Daniel, tell me the meaning of this dream. And, and, and Daniel looks at him and he says, and, and the Lord's beginning to give Daniel the meaning of the dream, but he's like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to tell the king that he is the tree, that God's going to cut him down. And he's like, oh, and, and so he says to the king, He says, my Lord, 
I wish that I could give you some other news. And the king says, don't worry about it, Daniel. Just tell me. Give it to me straight. And in verse 22, he says, your majesty, your majesty, you are that tree. Daniel doesn't compromise the truth. He tells the king, this is what God says. You're going to, for seven years, you're going to be driven away from the people and you're going to live with the wild animals. And you're going to eat grass like a cow and be drenched in the dew of heaven. For seven times, for seven years, they're going to pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. See, Nebuchadnezzar had the Babylon mentality. Look how great I am. I sit enthroned. And, and until he acknowledges the king of heaven. And so this is what happens. And, and then in verse 26, I want, I want you to see this. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you. God will always leave a stump. Like you run from God, you can go, go try to disobey him. You could go, there's always a stump that God can restore when you call on heaven. When you acknowledge that heaven rules, God's grace comes pouring into your life, and he will restore to you the years that have been destroyed. He's going to give you back what you lost. The Bible says he'll pay you back double for what the enemy took from you. And so, so you just begin to call on God. No, there's no place in your life that you've gotten to that's too far for God to restore that stump in your life. And so later on, this is what happens. Nebuchadnezzar stands up, and he's walking around a year later. He, walk, he looks around and he sees the hanging gardens of Babylon. And he says, look what I have done. Look at me. Look at how good I am as the king. This is amazing that all that I have built. And for the next seven years, the Lord struck him with, with madness. And at the end of seven years, this is what it says in verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. See, the Babylon mentality leads to chaos. It actually, the root of it, the root of Babylon is in the Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel, they said, hey, let's build a, a tower, and we're not going to need God anymore because we're going to build it. You, we never have to worry about a flood. We won't have to worry about anybody coming to invade us. We're going to be so good. And, and it says it was there that the Lord struck them with confusion and their languages were all changed. And it's not until the day of Pentecost where all the nations are gathered together and the Lord pours out the Holy Spirit and with the signs of speaking in tongues and then everyone understood again. The unity was brought only when we acknowledged heaven. And it says, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and all the peoples of the earth. No one can bolt his back hand, hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is Nebuchadnezzar testifying of the greatness of God. At that same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. You repent and you call on heaven, God will bring you back, God will restore to you. He don't mind you having glory, he doesn't mind you having honor as long as you acknowledge him. He doesn't mind giving you some things in the world as long as you make sure that he is enthroned above. My advisors and my nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. And this is great. In verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. There's three things that are happening, and these are the three questions I want us to be able to ask to discern if the spirit, the Babylon mentality has crept into us. See, there's an upward relationship, there's an outward relationship, and there's an inward relationship reflected in Nebuchadnezzar's statement. He says, I'm going to exalt and glorify the king of heaven. 
So the question you need to ask yourself, that I need to ask myself, is do I exalt God? It's my upward relational responsibility. That if I'm going to be influenced in culture, if I'm going to stand firm and love well, I better get my relationship with God right and I got to exalt God. I got to praise him that my heart needs to go upward as I follow him. I'm going to praise him. On Sunday, I come in, I don't always feel like singing. And if I was authentic and true to myself, why, I would just sit and until I feel it, I don't move. I got to feel it first, pastor. (laughs) And I made a decision a long time ago that I will exalt God. I'm not going to go, and I'll tell you, when I go to a stadium, I go to a basketball game, I yell. That's how I am. My blood gets pumping. I get a rocking and rolling. The ref's going to hear from me. I don't care where I'm at in the stadium. I'm going to let them know. And I'm going to let the team know. And I'm going to have my hands are going to go up. There's a lot of hands go up on Saturday. They need to go up on Sunday. And I'm going to exalt him. I'm going to praise him. You're not going to catch me praising a football team or a basketball team more than I praise my Jesus. The, the football team and the basketball team don't know my name, but Jesus died for me. And I'm going to give him my exaltation. I'm going to get my upward relationship right. And then the second question that you should write down is, do I acknowledge God? This is my outward relationship. See, the difference between exalting God and acknowledging God. Exalting God is between you and God. But acknowledging God is between you and the people around you. How did that happen? Well, I'm so strong, I'm so good, I'm so talented. That's the Babylon mentality. But when, hey, how did that happen? How, it's amazing that you got great job, Ty, you made it, you graduated from the Hope Home. How'd you get there? Because I'm amazing. I studied hard, I worked hard, I'm so good at this. I sit enthroned. No, I acknowledge God. God was merciful and gracious to me. That I was a sinner and I was lost and I was in my own way, but God drew me out of the miry clay. God gave me strength. God gave me wisdom. God gave me talents. God gave me abilities. God put me in that position. God gave me an opportunity that I never would have had had it not been for his grace and his mercy. And now everything that I enjoy today, it comes from him. And if you will acknowledge him and give him all of your acknowledgement, He will do for you what he did for me. You got to get that outward relationship oriented. And this is how we begin to influence. We get the exaltation right, and then you get the acknowledgement right. You got one more thing to do. Do I humble myself before God? This is inward. This is inward. The Bible says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There's a moment in every life where we have to choose. See, I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to be the one that's in charge of everything. Or there's going to be a moment where you say, I'm going to humble myself and allow him to sit on the throne. I'm going to allow him to be in charge of everything. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Here in just a few moments, your community pastor is going to come back. And you're going to have the opportunity to decide if you're going to be a part of this world, part of the Babylon mentality, or if you're going to humble yourself before God and give your life to him. I want us to bow and pray. Jesus, I thank you for the next couple of moments that, God, you're helping us to discern what is godly and what is worldly. God, you're helping us to discover the difference of how we've been influenced by an antichrist spirit, by a Babylon mentality. And I pray that that would come out of every one of us, that we would get our exaltation right, we'd get the acknowledgement right, and we'd get the humility right, that we'd come before you, and as we do it, you'd restore our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. amen.